Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Noor Kokiar. I'm the Executive Director of the Washington State China Relations Council. I welcome you today to hear Rick Larson of the Washington 2nd District, who's going to provide some remarks and mostly answer your questions. That's what he would like to do today. Um, I'm sorry Rick's not on because the first thing I want to do is thank him because if those of you have, I have listened to him a number of times uh, once we've gone into lockdown here. And whenever he gets a chance, he does uh, mention the Washington State China Relations Council with the first uh, executive director ever, Mr. or Dr. Robert Kapp there on the screen. Um, and he mentions that we are the oldest uh, state level organization promoting uh, bilateral relations, better bilateral relations with China. So that's, so I thank Rick for that. Those that most of you, I think, on the call know us, but our organization was started in 1979, the same year the diplomatic relations were opened with, between the US and China. We're a membership organization that incorporates business, government, cultural, educational, and individuals who have an interest in China. Our activities include promoting a balanced and nuanced dialogue with China, um, consulting with members, uh, consulting with our members as, as well as state and local government officials on their dealings with Chinese entities, um, receiving delegations from China and occasionally uh, when possible taking delegations to China. And we also work with our local Chinese community on issues of mutual concern. Last year, we founded a new organization, uh, which is a 501c3, a, a charitable nonprofit organization that's primarily created to um, provide education about the interactions between Washington and China. We also assist in our local community, particularly with the Chinese community, and we always encourage your donations to help us with our work. Another big part of what we do is create timely and informative webinars. Um, we'd like encourage you to look at our website to see what new programs are coming up. Uh, for example, we're planning to have actually two sessions on the Asian hate crime issue, uh, probably very late in this month and in early June. We also have, uh, we'll have speakers. I see Michael Willis is on. We'll have some speakers from uh, NBR talking about China's growing military might and what China might do with that uh, increasing military power. That's gonna be in later in June. And we also will do our first Mandarin session, um, uh, tentatively scheduled for the last, I think the last week of June, where we're gonna talk about some pre-revolutionary Chinese films. We have a film expert who's written a oh. book on pre-revolutionary Chinese films, who's gonna talk about that. Okay, so let me move forward to talk about today's program. Um, and uh, you all know our main speaker is Rick Larson. Our moderator is Sean Connell, Connell which I'll introduce in a moment. Um, a few bio notes on Rick. Rick represents Washington's second district, which includes parts of Snohomish, Skagit, Whatcom uh, counties, and all of Island County and all of San Juan County. Rick serves on the House Transportation uh, and Infrastructure Committee and the House Armed Services Committee. He's the chair and the most senior Democratic member of the Aviation Subcommittee. The work of this subcommittee is crucial uh, to jobs in the economy here in Washington State and particularly in the second district. As most of you know, the second district is home to many aerospace firms as well as Naval Station Everett and Na Naval Air Station Whidbey Island. Rick is also the co-chair of the bipartisan US-China Working Group which educates members of Congress about US-China issues through meetings and briefings with academic, business, and political leaders from both the US and China. In 2019, Rick produced a white paper on US-China relations, and I'm sure today we might refer to that white paper as most of it is still current. Um, Rick has also co-founded the Congressional Arctic Working Group, uh, a bipartisan group that brings more focus on US policies related to the Arctic. And again, China has has uh, expressed a lot of interest in the Arctic recently. So that's, that's an issue that is a cross US-China issue. So um, to introduce our moderator, I see Rick's on. So Rick will be with you in a moment. Uh, Sean is on the Washington State China Relations Council's Board of Director and chairs our Government Affairs Committee. He's also a senior fellow of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. Sean has more than two decades of professional experience in US-Asia economic and trade relations including serving as the executive director of the U.S.-Korea Business Council and a director for Japan and Korea at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He's also served in key economic development roles here in Washington State. In addition, he was, he was a Council on Foreign Relations International Fellow in Japan, and he's a visiting fellow at the East-West Center. Okay, just before we start, 
Um, again, Rick is here. He'll make some introductory comments. And then we have some questions that many of you submitted, those of you that registered submitted in advance. So Sean will go through some of those. But in the meantime, uh, start putting your questions in the chat box, and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, we are recording the session, and we'll make available on our website how you could see it in the future if you'd like to, to refer back to it. And with that, Rick, I'm about to turn it over to you, but you missed my little bit in the beginning where I said that I've been on a number of webinars with you in the last year where you have uh, mentioned the Washington State China Relations Council. So we, we, pre we appreciate the promotional plugs that you make for us. And with that, it's the floor is yours. Thanks, Nor. I uh, appreciate it. And I want to thank the council as well for inviting me to join today's uh, webinar. Um, I'm between votes. And so uh, I think it's been explained to someone there that I may have to just leave. And um, But we'll figure it out from this end of things. Uh, we're voting uh, soon on the January 6th commission establishment. So, but as Nor said, uh, Rick Larson, my district is north of Seattle and none of Seattle to think about it geographically. Uh, and he went through some of the um, uh, ge uh, geography and some of the things I'm doing in Congress. So I'll, I'll skip all that uh, and then just jump on to priorities in Congress. Uh, so one of my priorities in Congress is to be uh, a leading voice for economic and strategic engagement uh, in the Asia Pacific. And the U.S.-China Working Group, which I helped establish now 16 years ago, is one way for members of Congress to meet and discuss and learn about the U.S.-China relationship um, and, and how it changes over time. So I started this in 2005, uh, and, uh, but had several Republican co-chairs. The current Republican co-chair is Darren LaHood, a representative from Illinois. I've traveled to China uh, 11 times with members of the US-China Working Group or as members as a member of a what we call a congressional delegation trip, a CODEL. Most recently, we were there in 2019. And uh, look forward to traveling again to China once we can get past the pandemic and sort out what the rules are for traveling to China. Uh, members of Congress have diverse views on the relationship uh, that the United States has with uh, China. But uh, generally, uh, we share a perspective that engagement and dialogue are essential to achieve U.S. policy goals. Uh, last week, Representative LaHood and I met virtually with uh, Ambassador, Chinese Ambassador Sway to discuss the current state of the relationship uh, between our two countries. Um, so we're still maintaining engagement even through the pandemic. As Nora outlined in his uh, op-ed in the Seattle Times recently, the bilateral U.S.-China relationship is not just an issue that matters in Washington, D.C. It's vitally important to my constituents and for the communities around the United States, which is in part why um, I was so interested in, in uh, creating the U.S.-China Working Group. Not because it was a D.C. A DC thing to do, uh, but because it was a Washington State and Second District thing to do. Washington is the most trade-dependent state in the country, and China is Washington State's largest trading partner in everything from uh, uh, airplanes to cherries. In Somish County, where I was born and raised and in part represent, 60% of all jobs are still dependent upon trade. And the pandemic and the previous administration's China policy though has had a devastating effect on the state's economy when you combine the pandemic with tariffs. Um, and Washington State exports to China were down from 14.6 billion in 2018 to just 3.5 billion in 2020. Uh, the new administration has a little different approach and I'll, uh, to China and I'll try to cover that. I know that was a, one set of the questions. But uh, before I get there, I wanna talk a little bit about Congress because I used to classify members of Congress using the, um, the hawk and dove approach. So there are three different flocks of China hawks in Congress. Um, there were the economic hawks who focused on uh, trade issues, the national security hawks, which focused on national security, and the human rights hawks, those folks who focused on uh, uh, China's human rights record. But this view is, uh, I've concluded, is a bit outdated. And instead now I classify members of Congress as, uh, with regards to China as punishers, decouplers, or salvagers just kind of a reordering of a way to think about Congress. 
The Punishers, uh, they seek to harm China because of lost jobs, stolen IP, or other offenses. And you see that reflected in action statements and uh, legislation. The decouplers uh, really wish to sever the economic relationship. Uh, that is, decouple uh, the U.S. economy from China. I, one thing, I don't think it's possible. And second, I do think it is important that we do consider specific areas of the supply chain where it would be better that we didn't have supply chains so much tied to China. But there, there are, but whole scale decoupling is, uh, I, I would argue is a fantasy um, and not a very good one with that. The salvagers like myself, uh, I think uh, view engagement with China as necessary to, to achieving uh, US interests and US policy goals. And that can mean anything from uh, technology um, to human rights, to the economy, to national security goals. Uh, today, there is a broad consensus in Congress that China is a competitor and a strategic one at that. And there are real challenges in the bilateral relationship and they, sh they should not be um, uh, um, either, you know, poo pooed or forgotten. Um, human rights, uh, technology, competition, uh, Chinese economic behavior, uh, all in uh, the view of many members of Congress, including myself, are areas that do require us to engage uh, with China, but also be sure that we are acting in U.S. interests in doing so. And sometimes that U.S. interest might be different than it was how we thought of it 15, 20 years ago. The Senate itself is working on legislation that would, uh, the Endless Frontiers Act, that would invest in U.S. scientific leadership as part of a strategy to better compete with China. This is a good idea to go on offense, to improve ourselves, to invest in U.S. strengths um, in, uh, that benefit us, not just relative to China, but relative to what our strengths ought to be as the leading um, economy in the world and maintain that leadership. The Biden administration, as I noted, views China as a strategic competitor, but approaching China in a different and I think smarter manner than the last administration. Uh, big difference, uh, working with partners and multilateral organizations to increase pressure on China in specific areas. Uh, second, making explicit the connection between strengthening America at home and increasing our influence abroad. So when you think about the American jobs plan and the major infrastructure investment, this is not just um, about creating jobs at home, it is about making the United States economy more competitive, not just for um, uh, its own sake, but also to maintain our economic leadership in the world. And a third difference is that the, um, I, I doubt very much that you'll hear this president talk about the leadership in China being friends or enemies or anything else. This will be policy driven approaches, not personality driven approaches. And as I see it, the, the Biden team is uh, really being built around experts in the area uh, geography of the Asia Pacific with Kathleen Hicks and Eli Ratner at the Department of Defense as a, for instance, Laura Rosenberger and Kirk Campbell at the National Security Council and Catherine Tai as the new, new U.S. trade rep. And I will say from a congressional perspective, the uh, Congress uh, will give very little wiggle room to Biden, Harris, and the administration on two key issues. One is protecting human rights, particularly in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. And the second is in technology competition and the standard setting that needs to take place. So that those standards uh, that, do, uh, that are set uh, among standard setting bodies internationally are really focused on transparency, on open markets, um, and on, on protecting uh, privacy. So I and member, many members of Congress will continue to work with the Biden administration on a better approach and I'm hopeful that my white paper, as more noted, will be a helpful framework. Um, I'll end it there, but I would just note there are many areas that, of that um, white paper that are, um, uh, I just would commend people to it, recognizing that there are areas of conflict and competition, that uh, recognizing we need to get our own house in order, uh, identifying areas where bilateral cooperation is in both interests. There are a lot of areas there that I hope that we'll pursue. I have behind me a couple of books I'd recommend. I haven't read one of them. It's Middle Class Shanghai by Chung Li from the Brookings Institution. Um, it's a, Chung has, has a uh, great reputation for being very complete. And this is a very complete book. 
Um, so I'd recommend that. And the other one is uh, Mike Green's book on the history of uh, US-China relations. There's a third book that's not on the shelf. It's uh, on my floor at home next to my bed. It's Ryan Haas's uh, new book, um, also from Brookings. Uh, I forget the name of it because I just kind of start reading, I start reading it, but Ryan Haas, H-A-S-S. The reason I plugged that book is um, because Ryan's actually from Bellingham, Washington and, uh, and a very accomplished uh, uh, China, uh, China thinker and China scholar and practitioner of policy. So the, title is, well. the title is Stronger. Stronger, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, so with that, uh, I turn it over uh, back to you, Nor, uh, for the moderator. And so you see me like glancing over here. My my television with C-SPAN is on. I'm watching the vote. <laughs> so just uh, not, you know, forgive me for I, I won't be. I won't ask forgiveness for being distracted by exercising my constitutional right. But uh, that is the distraction. So <laughs> thanks, Nor. Great. Okay. Well, actually, Sean has got the questions teed up, so we're going to turn All it right. over to Sean. Well, thank you, Noor, and uh, thank you, Congressman Larson, for sharing your insights and perspectives on the U.S.-China relationship, uh, the Biden administration's emerging policies, and the ways that you and your colleagues in Congress are approaching China's strategies to advance U.S. Speaking with Noor. The council and its members deeply appreciate your leadership in advancing a proactive whole of government U.S. strategy for China. In reviewing your white paper, one of the things we were struck by was how many of your recommendations have already been taken up by the administration. And also the degree to which they dovetail with recommendations uh, the council has heard from its members and from its partner industry organizations here in Washington state about what Washington businesses are looking for to increase their competitiveness with China. And uh, to start off uh, our discussion today, uh, and also to bring this back to the, uh, to the local connection, including um, the reasons you mentioned for creating the working group, because this is so critical here in Sonoma County uh, and across the second congressional district. From your vantage point in, China, uh, in Congress, what are the most important actions that Washington state businesses, state and local officials, and other stakeholders uh, here within the state can do to help advance constructive and competitive U.S.-China relations? Yeah, thanks. I think the I think the first thing, uh, if if you if you haven't arrived at the point of understanding this, you, you I would ask you to please do this. You need to arrive at the point that oh, by the way, Sam Kaplan's book is a real good one too. Hey, Sam. Um, uh, um, uh, you have to arrive at the point that the um, the bilateral relationship is not in a great place that this administration and this Congress uh, is going to be much tougher than it was say under the Obama administration's approach. Uh, although I think the Obama folks would totally disagree with me, uh, but there are Obama folks who are now serving in this administration who have also um, changed their uh, kind of ch changed their approach approaches somewhat to be a little bit, uh, a little bit tougher on the relationship, especially in, in national security issues and economic issues. And, um, uh, and so that if you are taking an approach that, again, that, that maybe the US uh, business community will be the, um, you know, the bastion of engagement, um, you're, you're a little bit out of step with the approach that the administration's taking. And I think uh, is the reality of the current state of the relationship. We do need to be more vocal about state-owned enterprises. We do need to be more vocal about um, protectionism. We do need to be more, much more vocal about uh, technology and the security. More importantly, it's a security around the technology. Uh, it's not just technology for its own sake. Uh, it's a security around the technology. And understand that that's for real. And there's not, again, I said, no. there's no wiggle room there from Congress, but it also is a current state of reality and it's a current, and, it, and it's, and it's the reality, I think we maybe sometimes got there by accident, but it actually is a pretty good reflection of the kind of the approach that we ought to be taking right now. And I say that as someone who we, sh we need to engage with China. Um, I have colleagues who just re you know look at me like I've got a horn grown out of my head um, when I argue that it's better to be in the room making this point than outside of the room yelling at a door that's closed in your face. Uh, but uh, engagement is, is still pretty critical. So I think you need to understand the second thing is there are areas of cooperation. Ryan Haas talks about this in his book. I talk about my white paper. Even the administration is taking this approach too. 
we are going to be approaching at some point what to do about tariffs. We will certainly already we're approaching uh, climate change and the economic opportunities that can come with climate change, uh, helping China, helping the rest of the world as well. Um, we will be cooperating um, as it's a reality on pandemic and pandemic recovery and on future global health. That we just have to do that and we can't do that without China. China can't do it without us. We can't do it without the rest of the world. So I think you need to just be more particular in uh, looking at where those opportunities are, but just understand as well that it's, it's not like it was um, uh, uh, in terms of the, the bilateral relationship. Thank you uh, for, for those perspectives. And uh, this, uh, this moves into another question that uh, you've already touched upon a little bit, which is some of the pending legislation uh, that is currently uh, under consideration or being discussed in China, you, or in, uh, in Congress, I apologize. You mentioned the Endless Frontiers <laughs> Act. It's, it's being discussed in China as well. I yeah. agree. <laughs> you mentioned the Endless Frontiers Act. Uh, there's also the Strategic Competition Act. And uh, from your vantage point, which which of these bills that are out there or that may be under discussion but not uh, yet introduced might have the biggest impact either for for positive improvement in the bilateral relationship or also for really Yeah, yeah. I, look, I think um, you know I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a heretic here. And Bob Cap, if he had any hair left, he'd be pulling it out uh, as as I would too. And being a little bit of a heretic because um, it, it's just that. The, the focus on the bilateral relationship is important, but frankly, under this administration, um, we have to be sure we're doing the right things domestically so we can do the right things out you know, in the world. And so the Endless Frontier Act is actually, even though it's being billed as some, some that you know, position us better vis-a-vis -vis China, it will do that, but it is something we should be doing anyway. And it's sort of using China as an excuse to do things we should do anyway. Um, and it is, and as I said, it's it's much more going on offense here in the U.S. to build up our base to be stronger in terms of R&D uh, and in terms of investing in our own economy. A critical part uh, of that uh, of of what we need to do in order to um, address the competitive issues that we have with China. Uh, the Strategic Competition Act is a little less of what I would propose that we do, frankly, and I think uh, we agree on that. Um, for sure. It's much more um, uh, poking at China, um, uh, uh, much more, uh, much, it looks at China much more as an aggressor that we need to um, be aggressive against. Uh, but again, I, there are other, other folks who, who write on these, on this issue that would both recognize that, yeah, there's areas where we compete, but there's areas where we need to cooperate. And I think the Strategic Competition Act is a little, Little less of a um, little less in my kind of in my bailiwick about how to approach things, but there's also opportunities to change that as as, as we move forward. Um, and then there's there's probably a lot of sm I call small ball. Um, you know, we need we need to address some issues here in the United States with regards to re uh, research universities institutions, um, ensuring you know not taking the approach where we're going to stop all students from all foreign students from studying in the United States or stop all Chinese students from studying in the United States uh, because of concerns about um, future espionage or spying or, or IP theft. The different approach is to actually um, educate the educators, educate the research institutions better about what they can do, you know, basically, basically practicing good security hygiene uh, for the research that they're doing uh, regardless. And because it's it could be said that uh, China is not the only country that sends students to the United States uh, where the, we would have a concern uh, about um, uh, IP theft, as a for instance. And some of those countries could be our friends. And so, uh, you know, it, it just overall, the approach would be better. And so we've been trying to get legislation like that um, uh, reflected in, in various ways, standalone bills as well as the defense, the uh, national defense bill. Thank you. Uh, you've also mentioned earlier that one of the, the approaches distinct uh, from the previous administration that the Biden administration is doing is working with our allies and partners and uh, is reevaluating the importance of multilateral alliances and frameworks, especially in the context of US policy. 
Um, what does this mean in practice, if you could elaborate more, and, and more specifically, for one example, how can fora like APEC be used to discuss sensitive and emerging topics um, in the U.S.-China relationship, including potentially by the U.S. hosting APEC in 2023? Yeah, well, uh, I'm not going to tell APEC what they ought to do, um, for, first and foremost, because there are a lot of members of APEC who would probably prefer that APEC not be a forum to talk about the dirty laundry between the United States and China. Um, but in a dinner last night with an ambassador from uh, one of our very good partners in, uh, um, in Asia, uh, the issue of, of China did, did come up and it was a major topic of conversation. But uh, I just th I think that, um, and just getting back to APEC, I, I, I think that there are regional uh, issues of trade where APEC is better suited as a, uh, uh, a forum as opposed to the US-China relationship. Having said that, um, I would expect the U US um, approaches APEC with um, the idea that no matter what we do, we focus on open markets, we focus on transparency, we focus on you know, regional harmonization, regula regulatory harmonization, um, and that we, again, just, just really, get, really get back to being a partner within APEC, uh, which is probably the best, the, the first thing we need to be seen doing. And, and, after, you know, and after that, then we, can, then we can sort out the issues. But I think being seen as, uh, being seen by other members of APEC as, um, as being there to assist, to help, to participate, to be a partner is probably, we need to, we, and I think we will, we just need to, that's the first hurdle. And after that, you know, it's like, after that, who cares? Cause that's what we need to be. Um, and we can get on with, uh, get on with the specific issues. Thank you. Pulling from some of our chat box questions, uh, Congressman, what is your suggestion for the Biden administration to engage with China on climate change and other global issues, uh, and also to push China to follow rules-based international order at a time when uh, China's behavior is a bit more aggressive, including in Xinjiang and Taiwan Straits, um, in advance of the uh, the upcoming 20th National Congress of the CCP? Well, look, I, I think that I think the Chinese government would say they're all for the rules based international order. It's just the one that where they where they create the rules. And um, I think that uh, we need to, um, as a result, we need to be again out in the world um, with our friends, with our allies, being the leader on the rules that we helped create over the last 70 years, which actually did bring economic prosperity to the entire world, including China. And the idea that these rules somehow need to change uh, just because China has a now second largest economy and, and, and has done a masterful job of uh, alleviating um, um, a lot of poverty. Uh, there are many things to, to turn to China's economic, uh, to look at China's economic success and everyone should say that is great. But um, the rules, based order that we talk about and no one understands, like no one at home, like, you, you say a rules-based order in, in my district, like, and, and like, frankly, no one, sh no one should understand it. It's, it's, it. We need to come up with different terms that, that, you know, that average folks can grab onto and, and feel like they're comfortable with it. But having said that, um, it's the same rule-based order that helped bring this economic prosperity that everyone benefits from. Uh, so it seems to me that we should be um, going into um, uh, well, continuing our, our participation in international institutions, in standards bodies uh, on the technology side, as I noted, uh, on human rights bodies like the Human Rights Council and at the UN, and really just keep driving home both the, you know, the, the soft power message, the smart power message, uh, how we, how we want to see the world, and hopefully attract flies to honey, as opposed to you know, browbeat people, uh, browbeat um, folks who might be naturally our friends or our partners on these things. Uh, and I think that's the most uh, effective way. On climate change, I would just say that um, uh, this is a, this is a, this will be a big issue that Special Envoy Kerry um, uh, um, carries uh, to the world on behalf of the president and the vice president. Uh, and that includes China and it will include China in a very substantial way. There are benefits to uh, China uh, and the Chinese people, I would argue, 
for addressing climate change. I've been there in January, in Beijing in January, where you couldn't see across the street because of the smog. Many of you have as well. I've also been there in May where I could see the, the faraway hills because it's so clear. Um, uh, but the point is uh, that uh, China's pollution problem is, is an air, pro air problem, it's a water problem, and it's a, therefore a public health problem, therefore it's a problem for the Chinese Communist Party's credibility. So it, the party has an interest in addressing this and addressing it effectively. And that's why the American Jobs Plan in the US is so important because they're trying to use, not to get into a commercial here, but we're trying to utilize this major investment in infrastructure in our country to help us turn the corner in a, clean, a cleaner and greener transportation system uh, in an area of our economy uh, that contributes quite a bit to carbon emissions. Not surprisingly, uh, the Chinese government's approach is somewhat the same when you look at just as a, for instance, it's electric vehicle investment. So we're gonna be able to each benefit, um, sorry, I'm just watching the clock here, uh, each benefit from, uh, from working together on, on climate change. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Shane, I, another question. I, I can I can multitask. And I apologize. All right. but I just you just keep talking. All right. Thank you very much. We uh, have another question here in the chat box regarding state-owned enterprises. Uh, since 2019, China has privatized five state-owned enterprises with external capital and governments, and domestically merged three of them. Uh, there are only 50 national state-owned enterprises, and how many need to be privatized for you and others in Congress to be more comfortable uh, with? I'm sorry, you mumbled the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the question is, uh, there are you only- The last part, you mumbled the last part. What was the right. last part? There, there are only 50 national state-owned enterprises. How many do they have to privatize to make you more comfortable? 50. Next question. I'm not even gonna entertain that. That's a, that's a I, I don't know who asked that question. I won't ask who asked that question, but I can guess, uh, but I won't guess, but I'll also say 50. Thank you. Next question. Uh, it was noted that it seems to be forgotten. Uh, the, the media war between the U.S. and China seems to be forgotten. Obviously, there's been some uh, actions on both sides, expelling reporters. Uh, and ultimately, the question, are any thoughts on whether Congress can uh, nudge the administration to reach consensus with China on this issue? Um, you know, uh, I'd, I'd hope so. Uh, there's just, you know, there's been this tit for tat, some people call it reciprocity. Um, this tit for tat on um, on approaches, and I, I don't think we're ever we should ever expect that our U.S. based reporters or European reporters, fo folks who have a, a tradition of reporting actually um, uh, with transparency, uh, that th that the Chinese governments um, or local governments in China are going to accept our our standards of reporting and how we educate reporters that. The, you know, at the Edward R. Murrow School of Journalism at, the, at Washington State University. But uh, by the same, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't um, advocate uh, to have um, uh, reporters uh, in, uh, in, you know, in Beijing and ensure, or, or not ensure, but certainly do what we can to defend the, um, the freedom of press as we see it. Uh, regardless. I also think that we need to, uh, like here in the U.S., we need to just be careful about, you know, making the Chinese media that's here in the United States, a, you know, a giant, a 10-foot giant. Uh, you know, I, I, I do not expect um, uh, CTGN to uh, do objective reporting uh, on, on China. I don't, when I get China Daily, I, you know, I stopped reading it because every article, every headline had President Xi's name in it. And it's like, I don't, you know, I don't need that. Um, I, I used to read China Daily quite a lot because you could, you actually, over time, you could read the trends about what was okay to talk about in China and what wasn't okay to talk about in China. But now the only thing that's okay to talk about in China is President Xi. It's like, I don't need to, I don't need to read the China Daily the U.S. language China Daily to do that, to understand that. I know that now. So, um, uh, so you know, I, we just, though, I hope, I hope the Biden administration does take a, a include um, an approach where we're advocating for uh, uh, non-Chinese journalists uh, 
to operate in uh, in China. You can, Thank you. I've always I've warned everybody. If you ask me a question, I will give you my answer. Just to, you know, I, it may not be the one you like, but it's gonna be the one I have. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, on to our next question. How much of an ideological component plays in U.S.-China relations today? In other words, are we in an ideological struggle between authoritarian capitalism and liberal democracy? And does any of that change U.S. policy towards China on technology or media or trade, amongst other issues? Um, it certainly impacts some members of Congress. Um, I don't really see us as uh, in an um, ideological um, fight. It doesn't. It doesn't need to be I, I, an ideological one. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to take our differences and just say that it's, you know, it's a convenient construct to say, well, it's not the Cold War. It's like the Cold War, but it's not the Cold War, um, which is kind of what you hear from folks, right? They won't admit that they, what they really mean is it, they want a Cold War, in my view. Um, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's ideological. Um, uh, uh, in, in terms of this, there are some members of Congress and the Oh, I won't name names, but just trust me, there are. They, they, and, and some scholars who see this as ideological and that um, it really is, if China wants world domination, that is the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party uh, wants enough countries to adopt its model in order to influence enough institution, international institutions and international decision making in order to basically leave it alone. And, uh, but to do that, it needs to have the, this control, this ideological adoption of what it's doing. Um, essentially to leave us out, to leave us out. That's, that's my very simplified um, Arlington Washington view of the, view of the argument. Um, I don't think it's off base too much, uh, but I don't think we need to have that argument to, under, to have an understanding like, well, what if, I mean, what if, we just, in the United States, just took policy positions and pursued U.S. interests that were around transparency and open markets and human rights and democratic small values, democratic values with a small D, and um, and helping partners and cultivating allies and sending vaccines. Um, more, by the way, 20 million vaccines will be more vaccines and being sent by China or Russia. Um, you know, and just doing the right things on the soft power side, most folks want us, most countries that I've talked to want us to do those kinds of things. And they're more than happy. They don't, and they don't want to choose between the US and China and they won't choose, but it makes them, it makes it harder for China if we do all these right things, truthfully. And then our friends and partners who don't want it, don't want to be forced to choose, can actually take actions that are supportive of U.S. goals and U.S. interests, and still they don't have to, they haven't made a choice. Because we don't, we're not, if China's in an ideological race with us, I'd be, you know, it's kind of like, it's hard to insult someone if they don't understand the insult. It's like, it's kind of like that. It's like, U.S. is not, we're not in an ideological race with China. We, we know what we are. We know who we are. We just have to go out and be who we are. I, start, I apologize for sounding Pollyannish and naive, but I wouldn't be a member of Congress if I wasn't a little bit naive about what the things I'm able to do um, or optimistic. Um, I couldn't be a member if I wasn't optimistic. And we just need to go back to doing kind of what we do, given the times that we're in, you know, make some adjustments. And, uh, and I think we'll be, um, we'll be all right, but let's do it. I mean, let's we can talk about it, but let's do it. Thank I probably you, have uh, time for one more question. I mean, All right, uh, and hopefully this will be a, a straightforward one. Uh, WTO, are there any moves afoot to reform uh, WTO to address the challenges to it that China is posing? Uh, yeah, there. You know, last year um, uh, or the last couple of years uh, in Congress, uh, we've been you know trying to get legislation passed to support WTO reforms. The last administration, to its credit, um, highlighted some real serious issues with WTO, and I think that that part of our trade agenda will be that. And I won't get into details that, because um, until the USTR, um, Catherine Tai, uh, Investor Tai really lays out, lays those out. Um, Jay-Z just entered with a piece of paper with um, ink written on it, and, but he's 15 feet away and I can't read the ink because it's written with a pen like, with this. Okay, 15 minutes left, okay. <laughs>
sorry, live television, everybody. Um, uh, I think that there's, um, until we hear from uh, USTR Thai, uh, it would just, we'll, we're kind of holding our, not holding our breath, we're just holding fire until we hear from uh, USTR Thai on that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do we still have time or? Uh... I go one. I can go one more, and I just and I have a public service announcement when I'm done. So uh, right, I'll shift gears a little bit uh, for a uh, question here, which is on a as a as a co-founder of the Congressional Arctic Working Group. What do you see as the most pressing areas for cooperation and flashpoints in U.S.-China relations related to the Arctic? Yeah, you know, and um, sorry everyone, I got the questions sent to me ahead of time, uh, which is a very good idea because these shouldn't be pop quizzes. Um, you know, you want answers to questions. And so I had a little time to think about this this one. So I appreciate the questions. The first thing I'd say is uh, you, the U.S. is a, one of the eight countries on the Arctic Council. And the first and, first and foremost, our cooperation should be with the seven other members of the Arctic Council. And we shouldn't see the Arctic as a U.S.-China place. We should see it as a U.S., Canada, Norway, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Russia. 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 I said, I was getting there. I was getting there. No, the Russia chairs it. And an eighth one. Um, but uh, so we should see it as a cooperation um, venue for those countries first and foremost. Uh, China trying to bill itself as a near near Arctic country or something like that. Singapore is an observer as well, um, you know, but we always think about China. Uh, but a lot of these countries are interested for because of trade route, potential trade routes and potential exploitation of natural resources, which is kind of Singapore's interest as a, for instance, um, probably more China's interest as well. But uh, I, I, would, I would just say that I think in thinking about the Arctic, we should be thinking about it in terms of the US uh, participation in the Arctic Council with the seven other members, first and foremost, and not as a place where it's one more place where we're going to, it's going to be U.S.-China re related, because it won't be, it just it flat out won't be, because Norway's going to have some say in that, thankfully. Um, Canada will, I'm going to go down the list. Uh, Russia will. Russia's interest in, China's interest in the Arctic aren't the same, as a for instance. So, uh, it really isn't a matter of a, a U.S.-China um, relationship. Yeah. So. so, hey, with that, I have my um, one uh, PSA for everybody, and that's just that on Tuesday, uh, I thought this was an uh, appropriate group, um, as one example of a group, the House passed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, um, which would uh, designate a point person at the DOJ to review hate crimes related to the pandemic and improves uh, the reporting of hate crimes, uh, as well um, as protecting vulnerable communities from bias, um, especially in light of the increase of uh, hate crimes and incidents against uh, uh, people of the uh, folks of the AAPI um, communities here in the United States. And uh, so I just, um, perhaps is uh, one more, one more thing is that we need to stay on top of here in Congress is to be sure that uh, I continue to ensure that the pandemic uh, does not become even more of uh, uh, an excuse for people to express their uh, racist biases. And uh, so we are increased, we've increased uh, the, um, the focus on hate crimes, especially against Asian American Pacific Islanders. So I just wanted to be sure that we get that commercial in for the bill that we passed and that's on to the president's, uh, it's going on to the president. So, so uh, with that, uh, thanks, thanks, Sean. And uh, thanks, Nora, very much. And uh, appreciate it very much. I, I'll sign off and uh, uh, let you continue. See you later. Okay, we know right it's now. a busy day. Thank, thanks for spending time with us. Sure, and I see a lot, lot in the chat. If there's questions in the chat you wanna send on to my office, um, we can um, um, spend some time and get back to you on those. Great. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great. Good. And, and uh, though Rick is signing off um, on that last note that he mentioned about Asian hate crimes, Nelson Dong, who's on with us, um, and the council, we're putting together a program, uh, hopefully a two-part program. One is we want to bring in community activists kind of to, from the Asian uh, Pacific Island community to talk about their concerns in the community. And then we'll follow that up 
with uh, the chief of police of Seattle, as well as an FBI, the head of the FBI hate crimes division, and maybe some other uh, individuals from the legal community to talk about how to respond and what the some of the actual issues and statistics are for the area. So we, we have, some of you on this call may remember, we tried to have the first uh, round of that, uh, the day that the uh, George Floyd uh, conviction, or the George, George Floyd uh, conviction, or the, the whatever it was called, was uh, announced. So we had to um, delay that. So we'll be doing that again in two or three weeks. So Nelson uh, will be working on that and we'll get the announcement out for you. But that addresses uh, specifically what uh, the Congressman was talking about. 